Hello everybody and welcome to the final Outside Insider podcast of 2018 here on Philly Sports Network. It comes at such a climactic time. We've got the end of the year. We've got the end of what may well be the road for the Philadelphia Eagles if a Bears and Vikings game does not fall in their favour. This is a big show. There's a lot to talk about. My name is Liam Jenkins. I'll be breaking it all down for you. And of course, giving you the big New Year soppy speech as well. Although there's going to be a video doing just that. You're a different audience. I mean, the podcast audience is a, it's a strong group of fans. And you guys deserve this second show this week. So if you're not yet subscribed and you're just finding this on YouTube or Twitter or wherever it may be, make sure you're tapping one of those blue links. That in the description, you've got one for iTunes, one for Spotify. If you could tap that, n- not the bum, we're talking about, again, dirty minds, people. Just get, come on, it's an Eagles podcast. Tap that blue button, hit subscribe, maybe leave a rating and a review. If you really want to be in the festive mood and giving me a Christmas present, I would greatly appreciate it. The progress this podcast has made over the last year has been amazing. And to see it take on a, a very different format, like I keep alluding to, and it be successful... It's just really rewarding. So if you do like what we do, just smash one of those subscribe buttons because without your support, there is no outside insider. And what am I going to do with my free time if I'm not answering thank you next questions about why your wife left you or may leave you? Or if you don't have a wife, just don't ask why your wife left you on Twitter. It's as simple as that. But anyway, we're going to get straight into it. And what is, again, as I said earlier, the biggest week of the season for the Eagles. And they've dug themselves out of what has been quite the hole. It's scary to think that we've come a long way since a humiliating 48-7 loss to the New Orleans Saints back in mid-November. I mean, I've even hit puberty since then. I haven't. I'm 23. Still waiting for that. Um, My November is still going strong. You can sponsor that at justgiving.com. But the team after that game were 4-6. 4-6. and and The Eagles responded with two big wins. Then they fall to Dallas. Those are two games which I would consider dream crushes. And yet somehow, someway, a miracle win over the Rams, a big win over the Texans. Two teams with a combined record of 21-6 and before the Eagles played them. And here we are, week 17, season on the line. Eagles peeking into a room filled right now with Minnesota Vikings. Wondering, can they get the job done. And I'm not going to sit here and give you a big rant about Nick Foles versus Carson Wentz because we're not that podcast, you know? We're not here to just make up essentially hot take BS for the sake of it because we need callers and ratings. Oh, no. I want to ask you a rhetorical question. And that question is, what's needed for this season to be a success? Like, what do the Eagles need to do now? For you to look back on this season in a few months' time and go, do you know what? I'm proud of that year. Is there anything that can be done? Is it playoffs or bust? Is it winning out? Is it a Super Bowl defence? Or is it just simply nothing? Like, there's nothing they can do. And I think when you piece it like that, it is such an interesting question. Because if you apply that logic to anything else and you take the, the setbacks and everything else that that team had, it's sort of like if you're in a motorsport race, I would say NASCAR, but I don't want to alienate a lot of people that don't like cars watching go in literal circles. But if you're in a, a car race and you get a flat tyre and you have to go into the pits and everyone else overtakes you and your lap's down, then you go back out and you get absolutely clattered by some, you know, other car and then you have to go back in the pits again. And this happened three or four times. I mean, what is the success at that point? Is it just finishing the race? Is it a a midfield finish? Because surely you can't win. I mean, there's a chance, but... Surely in that moment, it becomes the the fact that you've soldiered through such an adverse situation to pull through to a win. I've just realised that's another car analogy. We are ending for the brand in 2018. But what is it going to take? For this year to be a success. And if you're asking me, going, wow, Liam, what do you think? And I'm going, well, dear listener, maybe called Joseph, maybe not. I genuinely feel that at this stage, if they beat Washington, the Eagles can hold their heads high. Because the amount they've had to go through, it takes whatever happened last season and like triples it. It's not just the pressure of being Super Bowl champions. It's the injuries going into week one. There was no Carson Wentz, no old Sean Jeffrey. And then as the weeks went by, those numbers dropped severely. Now you've got a secondary without a single starter. 
Captain Craven is piloting this ship to greatness, and I will not be told otherwise. Defensive line had no depth without Timmy Jernigan for most of the year. Comes back, he's out again a game later. Gave it a good shot. Darren Sproles, that whole injury saga. Then you've got the Eagles injury staff being quizzed on everything because it genuinely feels like they've been given a plastic stethoscope for Christmas, just been holding it on everyone's forehead and saying you've got a broken ankle. There has been so much adversity with this team. Where if they can respond from being 4-6 and six and being decimated by the Saints. And then suffering a dream crusher against the Cowboys. At that point, when that touchdown went in overtime and Amari Cooper ran past Russell Douglas. And Douglas dropped his head and looked like it was all going to cry. Like, that was exhaustion. Like, that defense played its tail off. That is so American of me. Play its butt off. Uh, they played so hard that whole game. The entire team did. They rallied. They fought with everything they had. It ultimately wasn't enough. From a neutral standpoint, it was a fantastic game. From an Eagles fan uh, perspective, it was just heartbreaking. So the Eagles fall 29-23 in overtime. And then somehow after that, they rallied the next week to beat the Rams. Without Carson Wentz. Then they rallied to beat the Texans. Without Carson Wentz. How is that not a success? Like, I understand. They choked against the Titans. They choked against the Panthers. They choked against the Cowboys. They got obliterated by the Saints. Like, I understand. It is, it's not a successful season. But for this season to be considered, overall, looking back on it, that team did all right, all things considered. If they can beat the Redskins, if they can win their final three games, that is the ultimate nod to Doug Peterson. And his emotional intelligence, which of course Jeffrey Lurie praised so many years ago. Well, two. <laughs> it, it's unreal. You, I mean, that team fell flat. They were exhausted. That was rock bottom. And they respond by beating arguably the best team in the NFC. Arguably one of the best teams from the other side. And make it so that they can somehow, potentially, sneak into the playoffs. If they win, forget whether they make the playoffs or not. I think at this stage that is out of their hands. That does largely come down to what obviously happens in the game between Minnesota and Chicago. But if they can win out, if they can take care of their own business, then that speaks volumes about the culture inside that locker room. And the fact that Doug Peterson will not let his men quit. He won't quit on his players. And his players, more importantly, despite all of the injuries and all the setbacks, won't quit on him. And moving forward into a season where those injuries, hopefully... Won't linger too much, but this is the Eagles coaching staff, so give it four years. I meant medical staff, coaching staff are lovely. <laughs> but I genuinely think at this point, if they win out, if they can beat the Redskins, which is more than likely, they can hold their heads high. Because after all of that, after all of the, the Carson Wentz playing through injury, Lane Johnson playing through injury, Jason Peters playing through injury, Brandon Graham being banged up, Derek Barnett being out for the season, Josh Sweat being out for the season, the entire secondary out for the season. I can't think of another team in this situation that would rally to three consecutive wins. I mean, when it was first realised that the Eagles lost to the Cowboys in overtime, it was, ah, they've got the Rams, they've got the Texans, they've got the Redskins. If they can win two of three, if they can somehow beat the Texans and the Redskins, well, then maybe have a shot. But instead, we're at a point where they've already won the two biggest challenges. And the level of energy and character and charisma and simple just excitement, I suppose, that has been injected by Nick Foles has been absolutely ridiculous. And that, for me, is the biggest takeaway. That through it all, through every high, every exasperating low, this team has held strong, didn't lose its character, took two dream-crushing punches to the chin and still sat back up and still went for another round. And that, for me, is all you can ask. That is all you can ask. You gave it 100%. They didn't bail. They didn't quit when the things got tough. They didn't fold. They didn't stop it. They didn't stop executing. They didn't blame each other. There was no lack of accountability. In fact, everyone was accountable for everyone else's mistakes. It's like, no, it was me. No, it was me. No, it was me. It was sort of like one of those scenes in a film where it's, I am Zach Ertz. No, I am Zach Ertz. No, I am Zach And, you know, everyone's the same thing. So, for me, if the Eagles can beat the Redskins, whether they make the playoffs or not, I think you can look back on that year and go, do you know what? All things considered, that that was all right. It, it was disappointing from the fact that they were Super Bowl champions, but 
that's kind of like saying, I've got this lovely bucket of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and I've dropped it on the floor and a dog has literally just messed all over it. But all things considered, if I pick it back up and eat it, it, there might still be some ice cream in there that tastes nice. Like, it's not totally ruined yet. So, that's probably the worst analogy. And that is the worst analogy I've ever said. I need sleep. That is horrific. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that was terrific. Not terrific. Oh, I'm losing it. I'm losing the plot. Uh, but yeah, if you're new around here and you love those dog mess analogies, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Again, we can't do this without your support, guys. Hitting 5,000 YouTube subscribers was amazing. If we could get one more push on the iTunes and Spotify side of things. Now, do you know what's really irking me? All right, now, the guys at BGN Radio, great guys. There's a team of three of them, though. There's a, you know, they're pumping out content left, right, and center. Fair play. I'm a one-man band when it comes to the Outside Insider and the Eagles Film Room and the articles I write at phillysportsnetwork.com. Like, I, I need your support. If you're going to rally behind me, if they're like, oh, we're in the top 100, all right, well, we're going to get top 50. Probably, maybe not. But if we can try, let's get the Captain Craven ship into the same bracket. Because, you know, I, I remember, I'm not bitter about this, but I there was a statement earlier in the year that said they were the only eagles podcast and i know that was a jab because of what happened with with john and leaving and stabbing brandon in the back and it sounds like a soap opera and it kind of is which is which is a saying shame again like great respect for all of them i love them all i'm messing around but if we could sneak up on them and go <clears throat> there is a better eagles podcast or, or another eagles podcast that has guests like kyle brandt and michael lombardi and sassy british analogies and stories about my failed you know, workplace career in a DIY store, then we can at least give them a run for their money and prove that just because they're a big, they're owned by SB Nation and they've got all of this, like, come on, we can do this for the brand, all right, let's be the ultimate underdog podcast of 2019, we've come on leaps and bounds, I feel like a rally cry now, I wasn't going to rally cry the Eagles, but I'm rally crying you, so take up your spears, take up your shields, leave a nice review, or a mean one, if you're feeling a bit angry. But it's alright, just slide into the DMs, we'll have a chat, and I'll, I'll calm you down. It's going to get better. But, if we could get a few more subscribers on iTunes, that would be absolutely amazing. But, we've got to move on now to something else, which I need to talk about. And this is a bit of a jab, I know. But there's been a lot of talk this week about Mike Zimmer. And... I understand why, okay, I understand why Mark Zimmer would be mad, but in case you missed it, so if you've, again, if you've not been caught up, let me just recap this one for you, all right, so what happened was on Wednesday afternoon, Vikings head coach Mark Zimmer was asked about, that there was a possibility in the press conference before that Doug Peterson had reached out to Matt Nagy, who of course is, you know, a big, big man in Chicago this weekend, the Chicago head coach, in fact, and falls from the same coaching tree as Doug Peterson. So the two are, are like that. You know, they're... I, I said like that and I crossed my fingers, so I forgot there's no video feed. But they're like best friends for life, you know? They share those little diaries together. They sit up late at night having phone calls about all the cute girls at school. And eventually they get very good at their jobs. And now sometimes they text each other saying, you up, lol. And then they have a little chat and they just talk about NFL Red Zone and fantasy and stuff. Probably. Definitely also listening to the Outsider Insider podcast. But um, when asked about the fact that... I don't know who's going to ask you like why you would phone a head coach. I mean, this happens a lot in Philly media. You hear me ranting about this a lot. Someone asked Doug Peterson, are you going to phone Matt Nagy to, you know, make it make that life hard on the Bears? You know, make it difficult for him to bloody get in. Like, go on, do the thing. Call him. Go on, go on call him, right? And Doug went, I might call him. Maybe I've done that. We'll have to see. Maybe I've done that this morning. That was the quote. So Doug, being very sassy, very white girl emoji, um, was open in the fact that he may have called Matt. He's probably just joking around. And Mike Zimmer responds to ESPN, okay, by going, I don't care who he called. I really don't. I didn't hear that. But I don't care who Doug calls or anybody calls. And it's like, oh my word, Mike. Calm down. Calm down. That is classic Zimmer. That is vintage Zimmer. And then obviously it gets even worse because, you know, Mike Grow gets quizzed about it as well. And he said he's spoken with Bears defensive coordinator Vic Fangio. Um, 
I'm just interested to see how grumpy Mike Zimmer gets about that. Bearing in mind that a day before, he was asked about the, the digital draft board that Minnesota had bought. And he said that they've wasted $750,000 just so we don't have to use effing magnets. See, we're keeping this PG. Like, what? Who, who got Mike Zimmer a deodorant set for Christmas? Is that what's happened? Has someone promised Mike that they're going to get him a fancy new present or a new car? And he's just woken up to, I I don't know, like a stick of butter. Or he's been promised a a pair of headphones. He was hoping it was AirPods since they're the new meme. And he's just been given a pair of like JVC $3 like gummy things he sticks in his ear. He's just not a happy man. I I don't know why he's so angry. I really don't understand it. But he just needs to get a grip. You're a head coach of a football team. And it literally sounds like, okay, you've got a friend on a night out. You've all been here, okay. And that friend's got an ex. And the ex walks into the club, maybe walks past. And you're like, whoa, 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 John, John, John. Everyone's called John today. John, John, your ex is there. Your ex is behind you. Don't don't look now. Don't look now, John. And then John looks. Of course he does. And then he'll turn around and go, I don't care. Oh, she should get who she wants. I don't, I don't care about her anymore. Fine. See if I'm bothered. And then he'll storm out and cry. And then post an Instagram story listening to somebody else by the 1970s. That sounds scarily like me. Actually, I do that. No, I'm just kidding. But... Oh, it's just I don't understand. Like, he needs to calm down. If there's this much tension, he's clearly a bit worried. He wants to keep it very serious. Whereas the Eagles are just having a bit of fun with it. And the Eagles are at their best when they're smiling uh, and laughing around. But the thing is, there was also something that came out. um, And this has gone very under the radar. That Mike Zimmer's daughter posted on Instagram. I'm not that I'm looking. It was it came up on my Twitter feed. That he's lost 16 pounds this season because of stress. He gets to work every day at four and works till nine and ten at night. I understand that hustle. I I've not lost six. I've probably put on weight. If anything, um, you know, I tried to go to the gym. I've been about four times now. No development because I just, I can't keep it going. I I mean, don't get me wrong. Mike Zimmer is a great addition to the Vikings coaching staff. He's done a fantastic job. But if there wasn't already enough beef between Eagles and Vikings fans, are you really going to just give them ammunition that freely? I mean, we know what Eagles fans are like. We know they're the most passionate. You know, they like poking fun. They're, they are the best fan base on the planet. Do you really want to give them that extra bit of zest? Really? Like, if the Vikings fall flat on Sunday and someone goes to Mike... Do you think it's because Doug called Matt Nagy? Could you just imagine the scenes? Like, oh, it's so sad. Mike, just come on. It's okay. He fired John Filippo. Probably got very aggressive about that. I just, I think he needs a cuddle. I genuinely think he needs a cuddle. Maybe, I don't know. Something's gone wrong at home. He's lost 16 pounds. I don't even weigh 16 pounds. Probably. Who knows? Who knows? But it's got to be worked out. Fair play to Mike Gray for just rubbing some extra salt in the wound. I don't think Mike Zimmer's a problem in Minnesota. I genuinely feel like he has been um, one of the best coaches that the Vikings have had in recent memory. But uh, what stood out is, of course, when he fired John DeFilippo and he was like, I don't want this season wasted. Well, if you lose to the Bears, it'll be wasted. So you fire a Philly coach, you then get very defensive, and then your season's gone. So hope that doesn't happen for you. That would be a real shame. Oh, if I, you'll be needing a bloody Zimmer frame after that, because no one's ever made that joke before. Oh, this podcast is going downhill. It is going downhill. Uh, we've got to move very swiftly on uh, to a bit of an early edition now of Thank You Next, because there's a lot we've got to get through today. There's a few more topics that we want to talk about. And I, I genuinely feel like at this stage, it's become such a signature part of the brand. That we just have to get them out of the way, you know. You, you guys come in for this. You've also been so great in asking these questions and stuff as well. So I did just want to say thank you for that before we get to the sloppy speech later. So, without further ado, I just want to take those two words one more time in 2018. Thank you, next. We're going to start off with Nick Foles might be a Hall of Famer, or also known on Twitter as Isaiah Roombid1. Uh, Isaiah's room BYD well I never get the name right I'm sorry Isaiah I hope that's right we'll just call you Isaiah be much easier actually wouldn't it Uh, he asked who is on the Captain Craven ship we are all on the Captain Craven ship we are driving this thing into the stratosphere whether the Eagles go to the playoffs or not imagine if Captain Craven gets an interception in the Super Bowl I will dye my hair no I will I will dress up as a pirate 
Uh, that's what I'll do. I'll buy a pirate outfit. I'll calling it now. A playoff interception. I'm dressing up as a pirate and I'll record a video dressed as that. Driving the Captain Crave on ship. Because this man has been amazing. And if you don't know the story yet, there is a film room out on YouTube right now. Detailing it all to the fact where his mum now follows me on Twitter. And so does Craven LeBlanc himself. He is on board the Captain Craven ship. So currently it is me. It's Captain Craven. He's driving it. We've got Captain Craven's mum. He's just, you know, chilling. Probably, I don't know. I don't know what she'd be doing actually on the ship. I don't really know many roles on the ship. I'll be the one... You know, with the, with the, was it a telescope? One of them, just looking out overseas. And then everyone else who's on the ship can be the ones, like, doing the, the sails, you know, like, pulling them about. You can tell I don't know anything other than football. So pull the sails about a bit. That's what everyone else will do. Um, who else can go on this ship? I mean, you guys there, you're on the ship. Everyone else is, and every other podcast is going to get pushed into a lifeboat, and then we're going to fire a cannon at them. Because we're taking shots at everyone. And then if you listen to this podcast, if you are... Oh, I don't know. You've been a Philly Sports Network supporter for over a year. We're talking the real OGs here. You'll be in the captain's deck having a little party. If you're, I don't know, that one person that's definitely bought a Philly Sports Network hoodie and not just stolen mine, you're probably going to be, I don't know, in the crow's nest with me, having a little look about, scouting. Maybe, I don't know, trying to keep me out of the kitchen because, as we learned the other week, I can't boil an egg. Someone's got to take responsibility for that. If you are in my DMs giving me thank you next quotes, I would say you guys are the real OGs. You're the military, you know. Do ships have military? That This one does. You're the military at the front of the ship. So, with guns and stuff. Just, you know, shooting into my DMs. That's what you're doing. You're shooting up at me in the crow's nest all these questions about Captain Craven. The short answer, Isaiah, is everyone. The ship belongs to everyone. Uh, thank you, next, at Trutch28, a.k.a. Philly Sports Guy. Do you think the Eagles should fire Jim Schwartz this offseason, even though the defence looks a lot better? No. Look what he's had to work with. There's been no front four. There's been no secondary. I think when he has been healthy, uh, this defence has been very good. And even when you look back at his three years now, his defence somehow still ranks among the best in the league in many areas. So I genuinely... Wouldn't be surprised if they keep him on for another couple of years, maybe give him an extension. But I genuinely feel as though this defense has come so far um, and found that character and that aggressiveness and that individual players have developed so much. Like, you know, we're talking Russell Douglas, we're talking Craven LeBlanc, that it's hard not to see the value in keeping Schwartz, where this scheme, when it's got the right pieces and the offense can move the chains, more importantly, can put up more than a point in the first quarter, has got a lot of potential. The thing is, this defense wasn't built to be down by 12. It wasn't built to be, you know, playing put keep ball away or trying to keep, um, you know, picket defenses intact. It was built to be aggressive. It was built to be fast. And it can't do that if you're constantly having to play conservative because your offense can't score points. So I think Jim Schwartz will get a pass. Uh, Thank you. Next, on to at Nee Millie or NEA Millie. Lemily, I'm really good at pronouncing names. Talk about who you think might start in the secondary in 2019, because I think we've got some crazy young talent that's starting to come up with all the injuries. You're absolutely right. Um, I kind of announced this in the film room the other day. There's going to be a lot on the secondary moving forward after this season finishes. Don't worry, plenty of film rooms and stuff like that. I genuinely wouldn't be surprised if the starting cornerbacks are going to be Sidney Jones outside, Jalen Mills on the other, Craven LeBlanc in the slot, and Avante Maddox at safety with Rasul Douglas. That's what I would do. That would be, that would give me a boner. I'm just going to put it out there. I would be hard because that is the dream Liam secondary. You move Rasul Douglas to safety with those rangy arms. You move Maddox there with his thumping power. And then you've got Jones outside. You've got LeBlanc inside. And then you've got Jalen Mills. We can tolerate maybe another year if we're, you know... I mean, there was a really depressing chart, actually, for Jalen Mills um, with regards to yards given up per coverage snap. And he is the only outlier in the entire NFL by a stunning margin. And I'm talking like it is ridiculous. If you want to go and follow Ben Solak on Twitter, um, he's got the graph up on his page. It is ridiculous. So, yeah, just keep an eye on that for sure. But those are your three questions today. I know it's a bit of a Friday. We're still in the festive period. It's that weird lull, isn't it, between Christmas and New Year when no one really knows what day it is. No one knows what they're doing. Uh, it's just like, is it New Year's Eve? No. All right. Okay. Well, we'll have another drink. Is it, is it New Year's Day? No. Uh, okay. What do we do? Anything on TV? Oh, we can't have Christmas films on TV because it's not Christmas. There's no New Year's films. Like, what do we do? It's a, it's a, it's that weird, boring part. But luckily, you've got a very, what has become loosely related Eagles podcast to just guide you 
into the new year. Um, we're going to move on to our next topic, though, and I've spoken about this recently. Uh, in fact, I've just posted an article on phillysportsnetwork.com where the Eagles now have got a very strange situation regarding their wide receivers. And I'm not, I'm not talking Olshan Jeffrey. I'm not talking Mike Wallace. I'm talking in the slot. Because there is a very large possibility that right now, you've got Golden Tate, Nelson Aguilar, Jordan Matthews. Oh, the boy! All oh, the boys are in! Right, next year, I don't know why I did that. Next year, there's a very strong chance none of them are there. And just let that sink in for a second. Right, I'm going to let this one sit. Right now, you've got Golden Tate, Nelson Aguilar, and Jordan Matthews. In three months, they could all be gone. Yeah, I think I've let that set in enough now. This is a tough spot. Because the Eagles were forced to move Nelson Aguilar outside with the injury to Ultra and Jeffrey and then losing Mike Wallace for most of the year, if not the whole year, we'll find out on Sunday. And then they go out and bring back Jordan Matthews. And Matthews, as we all know, since 2014, has the most yards of any slot wide receiver. Or at least he did go into the season. Whether that still applies or not, I'll have to double check. And you can make so many arguments about Jordan Matthews. Now, I myself, uh, I won't say I'm a Jordan Matthews stan. I've just got a lot more respect for him than most people do. Because a lot of guys look at Matthews and they just see the drops, which I really don't understand. Like, Philadelphia fans have three obsessions, okay, when it comes to this team that they will never admit to. And I'm not talking obsessed with winning or the Super Bowl or bringing back defense or snowballs and Santa. I'm talking, like, genuine obsessions they will never admit to. Okay, one of them is Jordan Matthews, and be it good or bad, it's love or hate, okay? Whether he drops a ball, scores a touchdown, there's someone saying the opposite. He can have a 500-yard game, and someone will go, nee, not as good as Olshan, right? And it's like, well, yeah, okay, well done. Thank you, next. The second on this list of three obsessions that Philadelphia fans will never admit to is, I, I hate this one, I really, really hate this one, Bringing back the Sean Jackson or the Sean McCoy. Every off-season since 20... It's four years ago. Let it go. Let them go. He's 98 years old. Let it go. It doesn't matter. All right? It, it, oh, it aggravates me. It really, really... You would not see this in any other world. As a Charlton fan, I would not say bring back John Joe Shelby to Charlton. Probably wouldn't come back, to be fair. You just wouldn't do it. If you're telling me that you would bring back your ex from four years ago just to reminisce about the glory days, no, because she might have facial hair. Huh? Think about it. Exes are exes for a reason. Deshaun Jackson has not been with this team for four years. Deshaun McCoy has not been with this team for four years. It, I don't understand it. I understand... They, they had some great memories, okay? They they had such a good team, such a young core. You had Michael Vick and you had Deshaun and you had LaShawn McCoy and Brent Sellett and a young Zacharias Ertz. But they're getting older now. The Eagles aren't going to pay them. We see the same rumours every year. And I, think I can only genuinely name you one time there's been actual interest or it's pursued into a conversation from what I know. That's it. The rest is pure speculation and hype on radio because everyone seems to get a little bit flustered when their names are mentioned. That's the second one. The third obsession, which is a, a very valid one to be brutally honest with you. I totally understand this. Actually, I don't. I mean, calling young players busts after they play one game. And this extends to outside the Eagles. We're talking Markel Fultz, so there's now a very valid case for that. We're talking Nelson Aguilar. We're talking some people are already hot on Derek Barnett, which... I, I understand that one a little bit more. Sydney Jones has now fallen into that argument. People saying that the Eagles should just draft late round players. Like, stop. Just relax. I, I don't. Maybe it's because I'm not in Philadelphia and I don't understand the magnitude of how impactful sports talk radio can be. Just cut it out of your life. Just listen to this podcast. Listen to BGN Radio. And I know I was, you know, taking little jabs earlier as jokes, but they're great guys. And Michael Kist and Ben Solak do fantastic work at grinding the tape and understanding the game. Um, there are some other good podcasts as well. Um, even the guys at the Eagles Wire when they were going before uh, Tehran left. Like, there's some really good Eagles podcasts out there. Uh, Louis and Gino, they've now just added Tyler to their Locked On Eagles podcast. They're really good as well. Like, just check those guys out. But just, you know, just maybe just ease up on, on those. Anyway, this has got way off topic. Back to the fact, all right, this is a Jordan Matthews Defence League. 
who, let's be honest, the Jordan Matthews revenge tour has been well underway. But, as I was saying, so you've got Nelson Aguilar, you've got Jordan Matthews, you've got Golden Tate. Golden Tate is a free agent, right? So, well, during this story, we have Nelson Aguilar moved outside, they bring back Jordan Matthews, which allows him some versatility. Matthews comes in, does his thing, has a great game against the Jags, which I was in attendance for. I mean, it had to be. I've interviewed him twice. Lovely guy. He just had to shine knowing I was in the building, right? Like, that's, it's a bromance thing. I can't complain. Um, and then the Eagles go out, needing a speed receiver, try and get Robbie Anderson, fail to get Robbie Anderson, and end up with... Golden Tate, who is the com- he's just a yak machine, which is he's a running back that plays in the slot, essentially, which is fine, but not the piece the Eagles needed. So then, I mean, let's be honest, you've got two slot receivers already, you run a bunch of eleven personnel, you're now running twelve with Dallas Goddard in there because it's opening up the run. Who are you taking out to get Golden Tate snaps? Mike Grow understandably says, Oh, it's actually quite difficult or it's quite frustrating, and everyone lost their minds. And he had every right to say it's difficult to get Tate implemented because, as I said before, if you've got 98 salmon chefs and you had a 99th and you want a cheeseburger, where is he going to fit in the kitchen? He's not going to. He's going to make your salmon, which you've already got, and everyone's tired of salmon. Moving on. We're now at a stage where Golden Tate is slowly being implemented into the offense a bit more. But he's going to be a free agent next year. So the Eagles gave up a third round pick. I I guess somehow hoping they would get instant production. When I literally told everyone ever on this podcast, on film room videos, on Twitter, in articles. That it is going to be a long term thing. Golden Tate wouldn't produce for about two to three weeks. Because you've got to get acclimated with the offense. Get used to the timing of a new quarterback. Understand the terminology. Get on board with kind of where he places the ball and that sort of thing. And get adjusted to your family in a new city and that sort of thing. There's a lot that goes into it for a wide receiver. So we're now at a point where after all of that, Golden Tate starting to get some value. If the Eagles get into the playoffs and Tate becomes a pivotal point, sound. Then this, this debate goes away. But as of right now, that trade isn't looking very good. Shocker. So, let's just say, for instance, the Eagles don't make the playoffs. Please don't turn this off now. And we get to a very important season. Where, on off-season, I should say, where you're going to lose the likes of maybe Brandon Graham, maybe Jason Peters, maybe Jordan Hicks, just to name three. Maybe Ronald Darby, to name a fourth. On top of Golden Tate, Darren Sproles, Nelson Aguilar. Oh, that's a hefty, hefty, a Timmy J. Oh, God. Howie Roseman has got himself... A lot of work to do. So who do you bring back? Well, I mean, you, I did, what they've done in recent years is have one slot receiver, one preseason hero. We're talking DeAndre Carter. We're talking Paul Turner. And my answer is obvious. The Eagles are not paying Nelson Aguilar $9 million. They're just not for one season. I don't think they'll afford Golden Tate. And I don't think they've actually utilised him as they should have done until about two weeks ago. And I really don't think they'll take that risk again. Because he's going to want a bigger payday. My money's on Jordan Matthews. And here's the thing. You can be with a million different... Probably not a million. Maybe let's say 10 different people in, in your lifetime. Like romantically, right? It's always that one way. You'll always have like that, that spark with that connection, right? And if you have a thing. And if it, you know, it, it cuts off for whatever reason. And then you go out and meet someone else. And that, and that sucks a little bit because it's different and it's just not what you remember or as good as you remember or it's a different type of relationship. You kind of look back on that one and go, do you know, I probably viewed that a bit differently. Like, maybe I should have... Ooh. And, and that happens, okay? I mean, it. we're all guys, except for, again, there's one girl that listens to this. So, in that case, you're not. But... Everyone's been in that situation where maybe they go through one thing, get to something else and go, oh, actually, maybe I made the wrong decision that time around. Like, that's totally normal. But if you get to the, the third guy, that's or girl, whatever it may be, it's very different again. There are three very different types of receiver. But the one reliable one has been Jordan Matthews. Okay? Prior to, again, that shocking trade to the Bills, where there was no need for it. I mean, Ronald Darby got injured straight away anyway. Um, I know his impact in the playoffs was there, but this was a shock trade. Matthews, he was considered a core cool leader that was so tight with Carson Wentz that he had one of Carson Wentz's dog's puppies. 
And I know this because I was on the phone with him. We had a conversation about it. You can hear it on a previous podcast. You can read it on phillysportsnetwork.com. Matthews had the most yards out of the slot. Okay. He scored three touchdowns in his final year with the Eagles. With 804 yards. Which, considering there was an abundance of changes, a severe lack of playmakers in 2016, a rookie quarterback, and no outside threats, other than Doriel Green Beckham, who was arrested again recently, Matthews was solid. He gets traded to Buffalo, then opens up on the Eagles injury staff, who very almost cost him another season. Everyone mocked him, and now looking back, probably very, very accurate. Goes to the Patriots, injured again, excuse me, injured again. Because of what happened, obviously, with the Eagles' doctors. He comes straight back to this team. And after getting his feet wet in week three, he caught a 56-yard bomb against the Colts and took it to the house for his first tutty of the year. Then he goes out and balls against the Jags. Then he turns into a third-down machine. He's no longer just a possession guy. And the thing is, he was forced to be a number one receiver working out of the slot. Genuinely, that was what he was. And now what we're seeing... Is someone that is is so much more than that. That he's playing outside as a number two guy. That he's been at WR1 before this season. That he's still got it. And as someone that was signed on a very cheap contract. That doesn't have the statistical leverage or the reputation. Or just any kind of leverage to, to bargain a deal like Aguilar. To bargain a deal like Golden Tate. The Eagles could get Matthews on let's say a two to three year deal. For the price that Aguilar would cost for a season. And then an off-season where they're so cap-stricken, they're going to go with, I genuinely believe, Jordan Matthews. Because no matter what, whether you've got the flashes from Nelson Aguilar, who has been so up and down and up and down, it's like a toxic relationship at times. They never know what they're going to get or what the quarterback's going to give him. Or you've got Golden Tate, who you thought when going into that relationship was the most amazing relationship possible. Like, how could it ever fail? How could it ever go wrong? And then he cheats you in week one. And he cheats you straight away. And he starts treating you a bit dirty. And you have to sack it off quite quickly. Do you know what reliable is? The guy from a, a couple of years ago that put up 804 yards and a bunch of touchdowns that was Carson Wentz's security blanket. That was the guy that showed up to training camp two weeks early with Carson Wentz. He was QB2 back then. So they could get a jump and get to know each other and start working on drills and get acclimatised with one another's style. They show up to the Novacare Complex two weeks early. Did it before OTAs as well. Like, that is a guy that's going to go to hell and back for his team. And yeah, the Eagles discarded him. They bring him back. They kind of discard him again by bringing back Golden Tate. And after all of that, maybe now they'll wake up and realise, actually, it was right under my nose all along. That is the slot receiver Carson Wentz needs. And it's just dawned on me as well, thinking about it. 2016, Carson Wentz kind of only targeted guys in the middle. He's done the same this year. I'm not going to draw that comparison, but maybe a film room, who knows? I just, I don't know. It's such a strange one. You've got three receivers. Nelson Aguilar is going to be the high maintenance relationship. Costing $9 million. You're not going to afford that. That's quite your diva girlfriend. You know, the one that wants all of the, the streetwear and the... I would say Pandora. I don't think Pandora is a thing over in, in America. But all of the expensive jewellery. like, And it's just, it's very diva. It's very plastic. It's very fake. Not the jewellery. I mean, you probably are though if you're a bit cheap. Uh, as, as in buying for her. Wouldn't blame you. But I, I genuinely feel like that, you know, the Eagles aren't going to, they're going to say no. Like, getting them into a long term, a long term commitment with that when the price is at 9 million right now, no, nah, it's too much. We've got too much going on. Golden Tate, thought it was going to be amazing, thought this was going to be the great relationship, visually very pleasing. Maybe Golden Tate is to some ladies. I'm sure he's a very attractive young man. But overall, what you've done in the past hasn't been reflected with what you've done with me. You've not been the same guy. You know, I feel like I'm on some sort of reality show now. You've just not stepped up to the mark. You've been a bit complacent. You've started sleeping around and made me feel a little bit low. So, not you. Jordan Matthews, through it all, through every other failed relationship, has been the one guy that you've still got that little smile with, that's still going to punch in the numbers you know he's going to. You know what you get. You know the work ethic you get. You know the leadership you get. You know the numbers you get. You know what you get with Jordan Matthews. And that won't ever change. And that, I genuinely think, is where the Eagles are going to spend their money. Let me know what you think about this, guys, as well. Who do you want to see back in the slot next year? Will it be Jordan Matthews? Will it be Golden Tate? Will it be 
Now, San Aguilar, I'd love to hear your opinions. But before we wrap it up, we have got two more segments. One of them is very... Uh, it's, it's two statements, okay, that I found really interesting. One of them is punter Tress Way for the Redskins. It could be on for a very fun year if it ends in the right way against the Eagles. So, so far, he legitimately, this isn't even a joke, hasn't had a punt of his land in the end zone for a touchback. Imagine that. Through all year, he's not had a single punt go in the end zone for a touchback. That's ridiculous. He's four quarters away from becoming the third ever punter to record that milestone in a season. I mean, that's big. So the Eagles special teams, do your thing. They fit, do them dirty. That, we can't let them set that record. Like, we just can't. There, there's got to be something done there. Secondly, if there is ever a tiny part of you that is wondering whether the Eagles are going to win this game or not, or if the Jim Schwartz defense will hold its mark, just answer me this, and I genuinely mean this. Here. Is there a single player on the Washington Redskins was- roster that you're genuinely worried about? Like, genuinely good. Oh, actually, well, we, we haven't taken this guy into account. I mean, who do you mean? Offensively. Josh Johnson? Ooh. Sorry. Oh, he's completed 40 passes. Oh, three picks. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, Adrian Peterson. Oh, he's gone anyway next season. Doesn't matter. Oh, J- Jordan Reed. Oh, we can't talk about Jordan Reed because he's gone on IR. So, doesn't matter. Oh, Jameson Crowder, well, you're questionable and Craven LeBlanc's going to eat you alive. Hashtag Captain Craven. Oh, but what about oh, Michael Floyd? Uh, he's had 85 yards and a touchdown. He had one reception for seven yards against the Titans. There's no one on that offense that's going to do any harm to the Eagles. And now I've said that, they're probably going to win. So we'll take that back. But genuinely, if you look at that offence, there is no one that stands out as an actual threat. So the Eagles should win comfortably. Whether they make the playoffs or not is an entirely different debate. But we have reached the end of the show, but I'm not letting you go without the soppy speech. Um, I've kind of let one slip, you know, over the last few weeks. But genuinely, I just wanted to take one last time this year to thank you. Um, There will be a video, probably about 10 minutes long, of me rambling, getting emotional and thanking you all for your support anyway. So in case you don't watch that... Just thank you for everything because this year has been such a roller coaster for me personally. Um, I was saying this the other day to my mum where I genuinely feel like nothing overly extremely bad has happened. Like there's been no ex- uh, external circumstance. I've just had a bit of a, a rough year of it mentally, I think. There's been a lot of pressure on me, like most of what I put on myself but to get in and out of bad situations. Um, and, and of course with the website as well. Like for those of you who don't know, I, I work a second job. I run phillysportsnetwork.com. I have done for four years. And now we're doing the YouTube channel where we're doing a film room video, two podcasts, and then all the other articles as well. Looking after a team of what's now close to 25 writers, getting them press passes, bringing on photographers. Like It's been such a big year for the website. And I think I've just put a lot of pressure on myself. There was a point this year where I genuinely feel like I lost myself a little bit. Um, where I was just almost this like shell of, of what I was um, I hope that didn't reflect in the work it's kind of why I took a year off doing these podcasts um, and I kind of I bounced back and again I don't want to get too soppy but the fact that you guys have had my back through all of that and have been so supportive and so reciprocating to my com- content like just thank you so much for everything and I'm not saying this just to for sympathy I'm being just transparent because I feel like in this day and age no one is anymore you don't see people on social media being dead transparent they're putting up this front so that they, they can kind of pass it off or make sarky jokes because it's easier to just deflect that emotion than admit it's there and I just wanted to thank you because without your support um I, I don't know what sort of state this this podcast or this site will be in and knowing that you guys genuinely enjoy what I do. Like when you guys message me and say it's my favourite podcast or I listen to this on the way to work or it keeps me going through an eight hour flight, it just pumps me up so much. And I, there's been times I've read your comments and cried. Like if I don't reply, I'm really sorry, but I genuinely do read all of them. And knowing that this podcast plays even a minor part in your life, it, it means everything to me. Uh, and again, there's one person that said that listens to this that has been a massive impact and a massive influence on that and kind of just keeping me going and keeping my back up straight and making sure I don't just totally collapse everywhere. But just, I don't know. Philly Sports Network has gone on leaps and bounds this year. 
And this podcast, as I said, there was a time a few months ago, I was like, do you know what? I just want to be me. Like, I'm tired of just kind of sitting in front of a microphone and giving takes and analogies that sucked a little bit. It wasn't me. And then I started just being a bit more sarky, a bit more like David Brent from The Office, a bit more me. Like, this this podcast now, I know there's been a bit of criticism recently saying it's quite chatty, that it, there's less eagle stuff and more chatty, but it's me. And it, this is like the one show where I get to be myself. And I'm not writing in a certain style or talking in a certain style. I just get to be me, have fun, talk about Captain Craven, make some jokes and hopefully make you laugh or smile or relate to stuff along the way. And that's all this is about. I want it to be something different and there's so much planned for it in 2019. So just thank you so much for supporting me. I can't tell you what it means. And when I say I love you, I, I mean it. Like I'm, Again, I'm not just being soppy. I genuinely do. Um, I do. I can't ever put into words how much this all means to me and the fact that you're still riding with Philly Sports Network. So just for being you, for sticking with Philly Sports Network, for liking what we do and for just giving me that platform, thank you for absolutely everything. I hope you have a wonderful New Year's Eve and the best start to 2019 possible, which hopefully starts with the Eagles making the playoffs. Um, Yeah. That's the end of uh, another year of the Outside Insider podcast. It's almost like the end of a milestone. But from myself, Liam Jenkins, it has been an honour and a privilege to deliver these. And I I can't put into words how excited I am for next year. But you guys are incredible. Uh, to know that there is a niche of this fan base that I would call my own in a way. Where like, I kind of like look after you guys and I know you love this. Co- it's just the best feeling. Like I love you guys to death. And just thank you for everything. I go to hell and back for every single one of you. Um, have an amazing new year from myself Liam Jenkins go birds we'll talk to you soon